Before we get to some actual examples of evidence formatting, I want to make two things clear, establish two guidelines that you should follow when you're formatting evidence. The first guideline is that when you're formatting your evidence, you need to be ethical. You need to make sure that the way you're underlining, the way you're formatting your citations, the information you're putting in your citations is consistent with the intent of the original author so that you're upholding the academic uh, integrity of debate as an activity. The second principle that you need to make sure you are upholding is that your evidence is usable because you may personally like a rather ornate or curly font, but think about what would happen if you lent that brief to someone else or if you submitted it as part of an evidence club. The other people would probably have to spend some of their time reformatting it to the standard font. So when you're writing your briefs, make sure that you are ethical and that you're, you, you're writing your briefs in a font or in a format that is easy for others to use so that your brief becomes an addition and a help to them rather than a burden. Now let's look for an article that we can block. I'm going to look for an article by my favorite author so far this year, a man by the name of Jonathan Adler. He's a professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and we're going to go to his personal website here to see what kind of articles he has. This looks interesting. Reforming our hazardous waste policy, or our wasteful hazardous waste policy. So let's copy that name and Google it. See what we get. This looks interesting. Looks like we shall see. Yes, here is the actual article in a PDF. And it's talking about hazardous waste. Let's see exactly what facet of hazardous waste it's talking about. Jonathan Adler is a uh, quite an adamant advocate for the environmental federalism case, and this is one example of it. This paragraph right here, the very first paragraph in the article, uh, can be very useful for my affirmative case. So I'm going to copy this into Word, open quotation marks, control V to copy it, and then you notice when I copy it, this little dialog box comes up here. I'm going to click it and click keep text only. That gets rid of all sorts of weird HTML font that can be quite annoying when you're trying to format cards in Word. So I'm going to get rid of all the page breaks, and then after I've done that, I'm going to put quotations at the end of the card. Now the reason why I have quotations at the beginning at the end, and that's what every piece of evidence that you quote should have, quotations at the beginning and the end, is because if you want to add notes about a piece of evidence in a brief but you don't include quotation marks, it's very difficult for a reader to determine where the evidence ends and your own personal comments begin. Make sure you have quotation marks at the beginning and the end of your evidence. Now let's move on now that we've copied the quote to finding the citation for it. And the first part of any citation is the author or author's name. I realize in some cases, such as Associated Press articles, an author is not available. And so that's perfectly fine. You'd adjust the citation accordingly. But wherever an author is provided, you need to include it. And wherever there is an author, you need to have citations, usually inside brackets. Now, since this uh, Professor Adler has his own page and most credentialed authors at a, a university or at a research center would, we can get some fairly detailed credentials for him that we can insert into the citation here. Now, an important thing to note is that if an article does not have credentials for their author, that does not excuse you from including credentials in the citation. If you have an author in a citation, you need to find credentials wherever and w really with no exceptions. So let's go back now to the article and we're going to copy the article name again click keep text only to get rid of the HTML font publication source comes after the article name in this case if we scroll down a little, little we can see in the header New York Environmental Law Journal. The date is 2008. We can see that right there. The URL. And then my initials, or your initials as the case would be. This is the basis of every good citation. An author, credentials, article name, publication source, date, tracking information, 
and initials. Now, some people like to add speed citations to their uh, right normal citations to make it easier to read and around, and that's perfectly fine. Some people like to put it in the tagline. So you'd have Jonathan Adler. Sometimes they add brief credentials inside brackets and then the date. And then you'd have your normal tagline. Other people like to put it right inside the citation itself. So you'd have Jonathan Adler like that and then you'd have you'd have you read this and around and then you would read your normal tagline. It's up to you. You don't have to do that. It's simply an option that would help make it more readable and around without sacrificing the required data of the citation that you have in the rest of it. Now let's work on the tagline. This is often one of the uh, the most I guess abused would be a, a rather strong word, but taglines are often abused because people will put the arguments itself into the tagline. The idea of a tagline is not to make your argument. Your argument should be listed in the hierarchy or the organization of a brief. For example, you would have significance as a stock issue, and then under significance, you would have a specific argument. In this case, hazardous waste belongs to states. So that's your argument. That should uh, that's your argument title. That should not be your piece of evidence title because what the idea of a tagline on the piece of evidence is is to summarize it, not to make your argument. That's what this is for. So if we read this piece of evidence, it basically is talking about the scope of hazardous waste and how it doesn't it doesn't meet the requirements for federal regulation and, and it should as such be left to the states. In fact, if we look at this last sentence right here, it provides almost a perfect tagline for us and sometimes good authors will do that. They can summarize their own points in the article and then you can just copy that sentence into the tagline. In this case, mismanagement of hazardous waste does not involve substantial interstate externalities of the sort that would typically justify the imposition of federal regulation. So this summarizes the piece of evidence which supports your main argument. That's the purpose of a tagline and that's how it should be used. So now let's go over some brief review. Your quotations should always have quotes quote marks at the beginning and at the end. The minimum for a citation is author name, credentials, article name, publication source, date, tracking information, and your initials. Those are the required parts of the citation. You can add speed citations or additional information if you would like to. The tagline should summarize the piece of evidence and should not be power tagged. It should not make your argument for you. When you follow these guidelines, when you can produce a piece of evidence that looks clean and professional in a standard font, it is easy to produce briefs that look professional and that you can use easily in a round and that you can lend to others so that they also can use easily in a round for themselves. If you have any questions about formatting or exceptions to formatting or particular uh, instances that you would like to have explained, feel free to comment on this article on the Ethos blog. Feel free to email me and I'll be happy to work through those with you. The purpose of this video really is to provide you with the tools necessary to write briefs that are easy to be used and write briefs that can help you can help lead to a more successful NCFCA debate career. I hope that it has accomplished this purpose and that you have learned some basic guidelines that you can take with you and write better, more professional looking briefs as a result.